Hey guys, so we're going to talk about chapter 15, the physical and cognitive development in late adulthood now. Okay, so first we're going to talk about the longevity, biological aging, and physical development. So the lifespan has a maximum number of years of 120 to 125 that an individual can live. Um, the number of years an average person um, born in a particular year will probably live in the U.S. about 78.8 years and this was in 2013. Um, differences in life expectancy across countries due to factors such as health conditions and medical care because um, think about different societies and what different societies provide for their citizens, right? So there's, um, even though the U.S. is a very wealthy country compared to many countries, uh, we do not provide, like, universal health care to our citizens. Therefore, um, some citizens die much earlier than they need to, right? Because um, they may not have access to health care. So um, that is an issue that needs resolved. Obviously, our healthcare system is not perfect, um, but there's also an issue of um, health conditions such as obesity and cancer that run rampant in our society based on our lifestyles, things like that. So um, health conditions and medical care are big factors when it comes to the life expectancy in particular countries. So in 2011, the overall life expectancy for women was 81.1 years, but it was only 60 or 76.3 for men. Um, this is pretty typical. Um, women uh, begin to outnumber men in their mid-30s because of different social factors, their attitudes uh, towards health, their habits, lifestyles, their occupations, um, and also, as well as biological factors because females outlive males in virtually all species. Um, centenarians are those individuals who live beyond 100 years and despite their physical limitations most centenarians have a low rate of age associated diseases and have good mental health. Um, if you think about it that makes sense. I mean they have lived uh, to this point uh, um, that age for a reason um, so they're less likely than others who have already passed away to have these age-related diseases and issues with mental health because they probably um, can cope with stress a lot better than um, others who have who did not live beyond a certain um, the typical lifespan. Um, super centenarians are those ages 110 to 119. Um, uh, the compression of morbidity, so staving off of high mortality chronic illness until much later ages. So uh, uh, these individuals live m much further um, without developing these chronic illnesses than other, than other individuals. So longevity genes and the ability to cope with stress, like I mentioned, are among factors there's other factors, obviously, but among factors associated with living this long. So there's low rates of obesity, smoking, and only a small percentage had significant changes in their thinking skills. Um, so there's some biological theories of aging. There's several in your book. Oh, we're going to talk about a few. So the evolutionary theory, so this is natural selection, has not eliminated um, many of the harmful conditions and non-adaptive characteristics in older adults. This makes sense because... Um, if you think about what evolutionary theory really focuses on, it's sexual reproduction. And these individuals, um, any individual who lives beyond this time frame and develops some illness, this isn't going to impact their sexual reproduction because they've already had children. So um, we think about sexual reproductive fitness. Uh, in evolutionary theory. So these age-related conditions have not died off with evolution because they aren't a problem until after the birth of your children, right? So that makes a lot of sense there. 
cellular clock theory. So this was a theory that cells can divide only a maximum of about 75 to 80 times. Um, age makes cells less capable of dividing. And um, the focus here is on telomeres, so DNA sequences that cap chromosomes become shorter and drastically reduced after about 70 to 80 replications. Now, um, the research, though, has suggested that healthy centenarians actually have longer telomeres. So this is one support um, for this theory. So the free radical theory, this is the aging occurs because normal cell metabolism produces unstable oxygen molecules um, called free radicals. You've probably heard about that in different um, anti-aging commercials as well as um, commercials about superfoods and um, different diets because people focus on free radicals that age you. Um, but free radicals damage DNA and other cellular structures and this leads to disorders such as cancer and arthritis. So this related theory emphasizes the decay of mitochondria due to damage and the loss of critical micronutrients that are supplied by the cell. Um, energy sensing and apoptosis, so that's programmed cell death, are key aspects of this theory and this leads to a range of different disorders um, such, um, such as the arthritis, Alzheimer's disease, and cancer. So another theory is called the hormonal stress theory, and this is um, aging of the body's uh, hormonal system lowers the resistance to stress, which increases the likelihood of disease. So with age, hormones stimulated by stress remain at elevated levels for longer periods of time. So there's an increased risk to disease like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, hypertension. Um, and this, if you've ever heard of somebody being told you need to lower your stress levels so you can lower your blood pressure, right? That Those things go inside. So um, focusing on stress buffering strategies to attenuate negative effects of stress on the aging process are really important here. Um, variation of hormonal stress theory focuses on immune system decline with age as well. So the brain loses about 5 to 10 per percent of its weight between the ages of 20 and 90 years old. Um, brain volume decreases due to shrinkage of neurons, lower numbers of synapses, and reduced lengths of your axons. So the slowing of function in the brain and spinal cord begins in middle adulthood and accelerated, it accelerates in late adulthood. Um, to, there's a decline in neurotransmitter production. So if you don't know what neurotransmitters are, those are the chemicals that um, your brain um, makes and uses. Um, there's changes in myelination and neural networks. So if you remember what myelination is, it's that um, fatty layer that's wrapped around your axons in order to make the processing of information. So these electrical signals that shoot information um, from neuron to neuron, um, that makes that more efficient and uh, much uh, quicker than um, not having the myelination or having inadequate myelination, right? So neurogenesis is the generation of new neurons and can occur in human adults. Um, this may play a role in neurogenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and Huntington's disease. Huntington disease. Um, dendritic, dendritic growth may possibly occur in older adults and um, dendrites are, if you've ever seen a picture of the neuron, dendrites are the little tree branches that stick out on one side. Okay, so, and um, they're like your little connections to the other things. Um, so, this dec there's a decrease in lateralization in aging adults, and this may play a compensatory role to improve cognitive functioning. And this is an image of how um, there's a decrease in lateralization. So you can see here that uh, for the same information, this younger adult is able to process this effectively um, just using one hemisphere pretty much of the brain. Whereas in older adults, um, they need both hemispheres of the brain to process this same information. So their brains essentially um, kind of 
helping each other along these sides are helping each other along to process the information whereas here it's just a little bit more efficient right okay so the nun study so there's an ongoing investigation of aging in 678 nuns nuns lead intellectually challenging lives and make that may contribute to their quality of life excuse me and longevity um, they participate in the annual assessments of cognitive and physical functioning and agree to donate their brains for research upon death. So there's going to be several uh, brains that these researchers um, get from this study to be able to put toward uh, scientific the scientific um, field. Um, there's an examination of nuns' brains lead neuroscientists to to believe in the brain's remarkable capacity to change and grow even in um, old age. So the, as far as physical appearance and movement, so the most notable changes are obviously wrinkles and age pots. Um, this is why you have the skincare um, commercials that pushing these extremely expensive creams for wrinkles and age pots. Okay. Um, the shorter with age aging due to bone loss and vertebrae. So um, at a certain age, you might go to the doctor, get your height checked and you have shrunk. Um, but this isn't going to be drastic for the most part. Um, this is some, um, some change in height though. Um, the weight drops after age 60. Uh, the muscle loss gives the body a sagging experience. Um, older adults, so it's, as far as the muscle loss goes, so working out and maintaining that muscle structure would then help the, um, help your look of aging. So you wouldn't be sagging, um, like other people your age. So that's typically why people who work out are going to look like they've aged better, right? Um, older adults also move more slowly and exercise and appropriate weightlifting can help reduce muscle mass, decrease and improve the body's appearance, which I just mentioned. Um, vision. So vision declines um, become more pronounced in late adulthood. So there's a light dark adaptation issue, um, glare tolerance issue. So night driving is a big issue there. Um, which makes sense, right? Uh, visual field diminishes. Uh, there's events in the peripheral vision that may not be detected like they would in younger, in people that are younger. Um, and depth perception also declines. So a question that comes to mind is at what age should we, uh, should, at what age might this impact driving? How, how do we go about that? Do and you've probably seen um, some older people drive and you, you can tell um, when there's an older person behind the wheel driving a little bit slow, more slowly. And I know uh, many people probably get very irritated because this person is driving extremely slowly and um, you're in such a rush. But uh, this is a big part of it. It's, it's because they it takes a lot more for them to um, be able to get through it because they have issues with these uh, these visual issues that they need to compensate for. So being much more careful of a driver is a way to compensate for that. Okay, so there's um, diseases that impair the vision of older adults or cataracts. So this is a thickening of the lens of the eye. Uh, vision becomes cloudy, opaque, and distorted. Um, glaucoma, so this is optic nerve damage due to the pressure buildup of fluid in the eye. And if left untreated, this actually can destroy your vision. So um, that's why if you've been to the eye doctor, you probably get checked. I'm not sure if they do it just after a certain age or not, but um, they check for glaucoma. Um, macular degeneration, so this is the deterioration of the macula of the retina. This produces um, normal peripheral vision, but an inability to see center of the visual field. So pretty much um, the only part that's uh, impacted here is just the center, and this is a picture of what um, they're talking about here. So obviously this right here is the problem, whereas this out here is still relatively clear. So 
Um, this part is mostly unaffected, but this is extremely diff would be extremely difficult to live with, right? Um, hearing. So there's diff differing degrees of decline in hearing. So 63% of adults age 70 or older have hearing loss of some sort. Hearing loss is associated with a reduced cognitive functioning as well. As far as smell and taste, most older adults lose some of their sense of smell or taste or both beginning around the age 60. And just uh, FYI, uh, medication can also impact this. So um, adults at that age, even though they might not have some, um, some biological loss, they still might be affected based on medication that they take, depending. Um, there's a decline in touch sensitivity, but that's not, it's not extremely problematic for most. So it's estimated that 60 to 75 percent of older adults report at least some persistent pain. Um, older adults are less sensitive to pain, but may um, be less pain tolerant as well. Okay. So as far as the circulatory system and lungs, so there's cardiovascular disorders that increase in late adulthood. This is um, something like re resistant hypertension. It cannot be controlled um, by at least four anti-hypertensive -hyperten agents, and this is a growing concern in the United States. Um, lung capacity actually drops 40% between the ages of 20 and 80, even without disease. And this can be improved, though, with um, diaphragm strengthening exercises. So again, working out is really important. Um, doing different exercises for different reasons is extremely important to healthy aging. Um, as far as sleep, approximately 50% of older adults complain of difficulty sleeping. And I mentioned, or we, ta we actually talked about this in the last class, about um, the amount of sleep and um, having difficulty staying asleep is, uh, is pretty common. Um, sleep time and sleep efficiency declines in older adults. And we all know how important sleep is too, right? Um, poor sleep is a risk factor for falls at this age, obesity, lower cognitive function, and earlier death. So um, many sleep problems are related to health problems and lighter and more disrupted sleep than younger adults sleep. So um, I mentioned uh, before that um, my, my mom actually wakes up at about 4 o'clock in the morning and um, she, this is, um, this year will be her 65th birthday. So she's coming on to this uh, late adulthood stage. As far as sexuality goes, um, sexuality can be lifelong in the absence of disease or beliefs that older people should be asexual. Um, aging induces the changes in sexual performance, more so in males than females. So um, orgasm becomes less frequent in males with age and more direct stimulation is actually needed to produce an erection. Um, many are sexually active as long as they are healthy. So health is extremely important for this area of um, late adulthood. And so as we age, the probability of having some disease or illness also increases. Um, chronic diseases become more common in, it, in late adulthood. Arthritis is the most common, followed by hypertension. Um, the causes of death in older adults, so nearly 60% of um, 60 to 70, 65 to 74 year olds die of cancer or cardiovascular disease. So that's a huge percentage for just those two um, health conditions. Um, cancer is actually the leading cause of death in this age group. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for adults age 75 um, to 84 and 85 plus. Um, this makes sense. So as far as cancer goes, if an individual has lived uh, past a certain age, they may not have the biological predisposition as much to um, develop cancer. So uh, cardiovascular disease then um, takes hold though because we all have um, our heart just 
can't take can't take um, some of the things that we put it through right so um, cardiovascular disease being the second cause uh, or leading cause of death um, makes a lot of sense so arthritis is the inflammation of joints accompanied by, by pain stiffness and movement problems okay so if you consider, and I've talked to you about my fibromyalgia before, so if you consider this compared to my fibromyalgia, the difference is that there is um, actual inflammation in the joints. Although mine is pain, stiffness, and movement problems, and it feels like inflammation, I have the feeling of swelling and inflammation um, in my body. Um, the the tests and the images that I've had for checking for arthritis consistently have shown that I don't have the inflammation portion. Inflammation is what does the damage to your joints. So while I'm not having the damage done to my joints, I have the feeling of the pain, stiffness, and movement problems all over. Whereas arthritis can actually be localized pretty um, in, in specific joints. Uh, for example, my father had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and he, he had it in one of his knees but not the other. So his one of his knees actually was constantly just larger than the other. And he had it in um, a little less uh, strongly in his elbows and his hands. But um, his knee was his main concern and he had a limp from that. But, um, and it, like I said, it wasn't an all over pain. This was um, localized joint pain. Um, whereas fibromyalgia, although, uh, although seemingly similar to arthritis in the description, is more of an all over um, muscular pain and you can have pain in your joints, which I do, um, but it's not typically like a localized, it's more of a general all over pain. Um, and arthritis actually can, can damage your system, whereas fibromyalgia is not a progressive disease like that. Um, so women that indicate leisure time of physical activity, um, women that indicate leisure time physical inactivity, I mean, was a risk factor for development of arthritis. So women who have more sedentary uh, life who are not physically active as much have uh, more of a chance of developing this so as far as osteoporosis i'm sure you've heard of that if not anywhere else but on commercials um there's a, a extensive loss of bone tissue so accidents are the sixth leading cause of death among older adults and um it falls as the leading leading causes of injury deaths for adults 65 and older so, um, as I'm, I, uh, I hope I mentioned this before, but, um, a big, a big, um, pattern in this chapter was that exercise is extremely important for healthy aging. So, um, there's a low cardiorespiratory fitness is a significant predictor of all cause mortality. Um, strength training is recommended in addition to aerobic activity and stretching. So the current recommendations include two hours and 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week um, and muscle strengthening activities two or more days per week. Notice that this did not say that you need to go to the gym an hour a day and push yourself to this um, ridiculous limit of um, of lifting a ton of weights and doing a ton of cardio this is not what this is suggesting to maintain a healthy life and have um, a healthier aging this is saying just two hours and 30 minutes of of just moderate intensity aerobic activity per week so um, that's 30 minutes um, a day for just five days. You don't even have to go all seven days. And then um, strength training on two or more days. So you could literally work out just five days a week um, doing 30 minutes of the modern intensity aerobic activity and only uh, focusing two of those days on muscle act or strengthening activities as well. And you can um, uh, get these benefits of 
of healthy aging, right? Exercise has a positive effect on older adults' cognition as well. Um, so it's not just uh, physical, but also like a mental, um, mental um, improvements here. So it's linked with increased longevity and linked to reduced risk of falls um, in adults of 60 and older. Um, this is physical fitness and mor mortality rates. So uh, this is low physical fitness, medium and high. So you can see uh, women in any case are more likely to um, live longer than men anyway. But um, for as far as fitness goes, uh, low low um, fitness is obviously uh, more problematic than higher fitness rates in both men and women. Um, nutrition and weight. So calorie restriction increases animals' lifespan. Benefits are unclear in lengthening of human lifespan. Um, and we know that there's a ton of different diets out there that get really confusing, right? So there's calorie restriction, carb restriction, sugar um, elim elimination, um, there's people who actually just uh, go on a vegetarian or vegan diet for the health benefits. Um, there's a raw food diet. There's all kinds of diets that people do. Uh, but as far as calorie restriction, again, um, it increases the lifespan of animals, but it's not clear about humans yet. So the typical calorie restriction levels um, are about a 30% decrease, about 1,120 calories per day for the average woman, and 1,540 calories per day for the average male. So um, you have to consider, though, this doesn't mean you need to, if you are a female, you need to just go out and eat 1,120 calories a day. This is um, specifically for what they would consider an average woman. Um, and as far as males, same thing goes for males. Just um, this is something you should discuss with a physician rather than trying to um, make it a point to do on your own. So about 3% of adults 65 or older in the U.S. live in a nursing home at some point in their lives. And with age, the likelihood of living in a nursing home or extended care facilities increase. So as our um, ability, our health care, and our ability to help people live beyond a certain age has gone up, the need for these facilities has also gone up. Um, quality of nursing homes and, and other extended care facilities for older adults varies enormously. Um, home health care, elder care centers, and preventative medicine clinics as are, are alternatives to this, and feelings of control and self-determination are linked to health and survival in nursing homes. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about it, um, because this is a motivational aspect, so self-determination theory. Um, I suggest you look it up if you don't know what that is, DC and Ryan. But um, and that theory suggests, um, among a couple of other things, that autonomy is really important. So feeling of control of one's um, basically life or um, one's choice to do something, right? Um, and in this case, consider being in a nursing home and uh, you want to, if you, if, I don't know how many of you have possibly seen, there's a couple of different shows you can watch out there. There's a, there's a specific episode of Shameless, if you, if you like Shameless, where um, the people in the nursing care facility, they want to go out and have fun instead of just being stuck going to boring places the whole time. Um, there's also, uh, if you've ever, if you like, not, if you have Netflix, um, there's a show called Grace and Frankie, and that's um, a pretty funny show about women in this age range, um, women and men actually, but it's focused on the women, but um, they end up going to uh, one of the assisted living facilities for a bit. Um, so those are, those are really interesting shows to watch for this kind of thing. Uh, I 
also know a little bit about it. Um, my mother worked in a nursing care facility and I have visited nursing care facilities. So if you have questions about these facilities, please let me know. Um, so this perceived control and mortality. So this is um, people who are dependent. So people who do not feel like they have control in these nursing care facilities over their own um, choices and life and whatnot. They don't get to choose what they eat. They just basically have to do whatever they're told. This is this group. And um, there's obviously a higher mortality rate. Um, and this one is the group that felt like they had some control over their life still, right? So obviously this is an important factor for just motivation and um, which helps them live longer lives. Um, so as far as attention goes, so selective attention is focusing on a specific aspect of experience while ignoring others. And this actually decreases in older adults, okay? So um, we might have talked about selective attention before, but um, sustained attention is the ability to focus on, on the selected stimulus for a prolonged period of time, and this older adults perform as well as middle-aged and younger adults. So the sustained attention doesn't seem to be an issue, but selective attention, being able to filter out things, um, filter out unimportant things, um, starts to become an issue. As far as memory goes, explicit memory is the memory of facts and experiences that individuals consciously know and can state. Okay, but implicit memory is memory without conscious recollection. So implicit memory is less likely to be adversely affected by aging than explicit memory. So I mentioned um, implicit memories like the, I, mean, I had mentioned before, procedural memory in class last week. And um, that would be the, the same thing. Like having the, if you've ever, I've done this a couple of times, but if you've ever been driving and you just, get to a certain point and you think, oh my gosh, I don't even remember going through that town or something like that. Like, how did I get here? Um, because you have this procedural memory of driving, especially if you are on this route um, every day for like driving to school every day in the same way, um, driving to work every day in the same way. Um, this, you, you gain this memory of this, of this way to go and you don't need to put as much effort into thinking about where you're going as you did the first day you went right so that's more of a implicit memory and like somebody working in a factory that does the same thing over and over and over and over um, this repetitious uh, this repetitious movement um, they they gain this memory of how things go which makes them more efficient faster and that's why we have jobs like that right um that's how uh, people become more efficient but explicit memory is more about memory of facts right it's not so much procedural so episodic memory um is a form of explicit memory that's is the retention of information about where and when um, of life's happening. So these events in your life. So younger adults have better episodic memory than older adults. And some, uh, semantic memory is a person's knowledge about the world. So older adults often take longer to retrieve this information, but they can ultimately do it. Um, the ability to retrieve very specific information, such as names, usually declines with older adults, though. And episodic memory declines more than semantic memory. So remembering these events clearly, remembering them accurately, is um, is harder as you get older. Um, there's declines in working memory as well. So memory as a place for mental um, mental work. We, uh, if you remember back, I can't remember what week it was, but uh, where I had you guys, I was reading this list of numbers and you guys kind of had to keep these in your head. And then I asked you to tell me what the numbers were. Um, that is keeping these numbers in your working memory. So if I asked you today, 
you would have no idea what these numbers were and neither would I um, because these were unimportant details and we just need to know it for a short period of time and our brains do not find this important and it's tossed right um, so perceptual speed so that's the amount of time it takes to perform simple perceptual motor tasks it shows considerable decline in late adulthood um, there's a strong link between perceptual speed and working memory so perceptual speed consider a timed test um, people with a lower capacity for perceptual speed like their perceptual speed is a lot slower are going to take much longer on a test um, most likely than somebody with the same amount of knowledge that has a higher perceptual speed. And um, if I asked you, for example, to give me the answer to a specific math problem, then um, your perceptual speed is how fast you can answer that. How fast you basically can process it. Come to the answer and then tell me. Um, Executive function, and we talked about this previously as well, this involves managing one's thoughts to engage in goal-directed behavior and self-control. So um, I talked about um, impulse control, things like that. These are and planning and decision-making. These are executive functions. Um, the general aspects of executive function decline at this time. Um, considerable variability in executive functioning among older adults. Uh, there's predicted higher levels of self-rated health in uh, the community um, an executive dysfunction was a strong predictor of stroke uh, wisdom so that's expert knowledge about the practical aspects of life that per, uh, permits excellent judgment about important matters um, higher levels of wisdom are very rare uh, factors other than age are critical for wisdom <coughs> to develop <coughs> a high level uh, personality related factors are better predictors of wisdom than cognitive factors um, education work and health are important influences on cognitive function of older adults so there's important factors and cohort effects that need to be taken into account in studying older adults um, successive generations of Americans in the 20, 20th century were better educated, had work experiences that included stronger emphasis on cognitively oriented labor, and have been healthier in late adulthood. So there's better treatments for a variety of illnesses now. Um, use it or lose it. So we've all heard that saying, right? Um, certain mental activities can benefit the maintenance. Um, of cognitive skills so reading books doing crossword puzzles going to lectures and concerts are all really helpful um, my grandfather actually was a big crossword puzzle nut so that helped keep his brain um, and his cognition a little better functioning um, and my grandmother actually read I like to read books and she enjoyed um, how-to videos and things like that so those are things that that helped them uh, quite a bit when they were living um, research suggests that mental exercise may reduce cognitive decline um, iPad training 15 hours a week for three months improved episodic memory and processing speed so it's good to know that working out our brain as we get older helps maintain our ability to cognitively cognitively process things and remember them um, training and cognitive skills or training cognitive skills improves the cognitive skills of many older adults some loss in the plasticity in later adulthood um, especially in the oldest uh, oldest old um, cognitive vitality of older adults can be improved through cognitive and physical fitness training fish oil supplements um, link to higher cognitive scores and less atrophy in brain regions and last week um, uh, miles had mentioned fish oil and brought his fish oil supplements so there a shout out to miles for that information um, so fish oil supplements actually um, research has shown that fish oil supplements are beneficial. Um, cognitive neuroscience and aging. So um, cognitive neuroscience is a discipline that studies links between the brain and cognitive functioning. So um, this relies on brain imaging techniques such as fMRI, PET scans, 
DTI, which is called a, um, diffusion tensor imaging, to reveal brain areas that are activated when individuals engage in certain cognitive activities. So changes in the brain can influence cognitive functioning, and changes in cognitive functioning can influence the brain. So after 1995, adults 65 plus engaged in full-time work rose substantially. And this also increase, increases in part-time work after retirement too. Um, this reflected in the nation's economy may have may not have adequate reserves to fund retirement. Um, increasing number of middle-aged and older adults are embarking on their second or even third careers. Um, some of them are going back to school, which you've probably already heard about you maybe you've had some people in your classes that were much much older than you um, there's opportunities for productive activity social interaction and positive identity older workers have lower rates of absenteeism fewer um, accidents and higher job satisfaction than younger counterparts older adults who continue to work have better physical profiles than those who retire and I mentioned last week though that um, there has been problems before sometimes where people, um, because they have perhaps um, maximized the number of raises they get, um, they're paid more than these newcomers who are just getting out of college or newcomers who have um, some experience but not um, substantial experience. Um, so sometimes these older pe people in positions that um, pay a lot of money, get pushed out and forced to retire in order to um, save the company money. So that has happened. That does happen. It's not, um, it's not uh, great, but we deal with it, right? Um, this is this is why some um, some older adults may be looking at different career options as well. Uh, they get out of their field and they change what they want to do with their life. Um, so retirement, so when people reach their 60s, the life path they follow is less clear. Some individuals don't retire, continuing in their career jobs until they pass away. Some retire from their career work and then take up a new and different job altogether. Some retire from their career and do volunteer work instead. Some retire from a post-retirement job and go on to yet another job. And then some move in and out of the workplace, so they never really have a career job from which they retire. Um, some individuals who are in poor health move to a disability status re rather than reti retirement, or they moved into a disability status and, a, uh, status and eventually retirement. And some who are laid off define it as retirement. Okay, so um, I want to mention I did work for a um, dentist at one point in my I've had different jobs um, at one point in my adult life I worked for a dentist and I was dental assistant and the dentist I worked for was he was older and um, I had talked to him about retirement before and he said he uh, retirement to him means death so he knew that as soon as he retired he would die Therefore, he was not going to retire, and he would just keep working till he died. And that was his attitude toward work. It was his life. It was his passion. He wanted to keep doing it. And so he did. So older adults who are adjusted, um, are just, who adjust best to retirement are healthy. They have adequate income. They're active. They're educated. And they have an extended social network, including both friends and family, usually were satisfied with their lives before they retired. Um, so basically, if you look at this, it's they have uh, their job isn't their their main focus. Uh, they have friendships and families and um, they have they're active and um, their income is not an issue. Uh, they have already have decent health. Uh, these these are individuals that adjust much better to retirement. So psychological disorders among older adults are 
a point of concern. So older adults do not have a higher incidence of psychological disorders than younger adults. Dementia, so that's the global term for neurological disorders in which primary symptoms involve deterioration in mental functioning. So they often lose the ability to care for themselves and become unable to recognize familiar people or surroundings. 23% of women and 17% of men 85 years and older are at risk for developing dementia. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a, pro this is a form of dementia, progressive, irreversible brain disorder characterized by deterioration of memory, reasoning, language, and eventually physical functioning. So it's estimated that 5.4 million adults in the U.S. have Alzheimer's disease. Women are more likely to develop this because of longer life expectancy. Um, so this involves a deficiency in the brain, chemical acetylcholine. So formation of amyloid plaques, so this is dense deposits of protein that accumulate in the blood vessels, and neurofibrillary tangles, so these are twisted fibers that build up neurons. Um, new neuroimaging techniques can detect these plaques and tangles. Alzheimer's disease, there's some causes, medical exposures, um, estrogen, statins, and anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, some dietary factors were linked to a reduced incidence. And this is two brains, normal aging and Alzheimer's disease. You can see um, the in this in the Alzheimer's disease, you can see the big patches um, where the the tissue has deteriorated. So mild cognitive impairment. Um, this represents a transitional state between the cognitive changes of normal aging and very early disease. fMRI shows smaller brain regions are involved in memory for individuals with MCI. Drug treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So, um, well, I hope I can say this. Cholinerase inhibitors and other drugs slow the downward progression of the disease. Um, caring for individuals with Al Alzheimer's disease. Um, support is often emotionally and physically draining for the family. Um, respite care services um, can be used to help. Um, but if you, I'm trying to think, um, I typically think of shows that work with this, um, but there are several, okay, um, The Notebook is one uh, show that you could, or one movie that you could watch that relates to this, um, uh, where the the wife has uh, Alzheimer's disease, and uh, the husband goes to read her a uh, story of their life every day, so to help her remember who he is. Right now, you can imagine this type of situation for family would be extremely mentally. Um, just emotionally draining because you've had this life with this person and all of a sudden they don't know who you are at times. So it, it seems like it would be extremely scary um, and just sad, right? Because you want this person to remember you. So um, I suggest you look up, uh, if you haven't seen movies or shows with this type of information in it, you could look up YouTube videos of, of Alzheimer's um, as well as different movies that might um, give you more of an inside look on people's lives like this. Um, Parkinson's disease, so this is a chronic progressive disease characterized by muscle tremors, slowing of movement, and facial paralysis. Um, triggered, it's triggered by de degeneration of dopamine producing neurons in the brain. Um, several treatments are available, drug treatments and deep brain stimulation. Um, it's difficult to determine correct dosage and loses efficacy over time. So um, DBS involves implantation of electrodes within the brain and stem cell trans. Um, Plantation and gene therapy are being explored as treatment options. Um, if you don't know, uh, there's a, a major celebrity, or he was major back in the day, um, Michael J. Fox. He has Parkinson's disease, so he has spoken out about it. So if you aren't certain about what Parkinson's disease is, you could um, look this up on YouTube and watch some um some video clips of Michael J. Fox uh, with his Parkinson's disease, where it started and now where it is today. So, 
The next chapter we're going to talk about is chapter 16, and that's socio-emotional development in late adulthood.